Um, we thought we'd open with this rather charmingly um, grotty slide of maybe the, the, the seeds of responsive environments, um, which was a few years before the, the book got written. Um, some of us from different bits of what was then the School of Architecture at, uh, at um, Oxford Polytechnic and the early days of the Joint Centre for Urban Design there, um, started working together initially um, to put together a group to go in for a competition, which we ended up winning. And as happens when you win competitions, we thought each other must be pretty cool. So we carried on kind of talking and collaborating. And gradually out of that emerged, um, first of all, the, uh, uh, well, an exhibition about responsive environments and then, uh, and then the book. Um, and the book is very much uh, a group production. Um, um, Alan Alcock, who sadly isn't with us tonight because he's not very well, uh, came from a straight background in architecture, an associate from Paul and Moyer, decided he wanted to do some teaching and was in the School of Architecture. Paul Moraine, who again sadly isn't with us tonight, uh, a refugee from landscape architecture, I guess, who fell in love with urban design when he was a student and, and worked with us. Uh, Sue McGlynn, a more complex background, I guess, um, in, first of all, architectural studies with Bill Hillier and Adrian Lehman at, uh, at UCL, and then uh, planning at, uh, at Oxford Poly, and then the Joint Centre. And Graham, who is a very good painter, um, and was kind of employed uh, doing a, an interesting thing, which was helping architecture students to express their ideas in graphics. I think that kind of sums it up. So we came from a, 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 a different kind of background. Me, I suppose what um, was different was that um, I came from a, a property development background. I, I, I'm an, I was trained as an architect, but I worked as a property developer and then came into the Joint Center. So we had a number of different um, overlapping ideas, um, which coalesced around, uh, I suppose, certainly in my case, and I think the others, a, a, a feeling of rage at what had happened to modern settlements, modern cities, and how crap they were, and um, how important it was to try to figure out some way of uh, figuring out, A, why they were crap, and B, what one could do to, um, to change them. And I, and I put this figure here, um, which is a quite famous photograph um, by the Dutch architect Hermann Herzberger, because uh, he was, I think, a big... Um, influence on um, the way we initially developed. Um, it's from a book that Herzberger wrote, or photographed, really, there's not much writing in it, uh, called uh, Oppenbarer Reich, um, which is in Dutch, um, the public realm. And, and it summed up the, very nicely, we thought, the feeling we had about, well, two things. One is uh, cities have somehow taken the wrong turn um, if whenever you want to have uh, lunch outside a cafe, you sadly find that you're in the middle of a car park. But secondly, uh, aren't people amazing how they fight back? And you can write car park on a plan, but if not somebody wants to have their lunch in it, they will. So putting those two together, those, those two sort of um, outtakes, if you like, from this, from this picture, was very much uh, what Responsive Environments was about. But of course, um, whenever you have a group of people from different backgrounds putting something together. They always, I mean, nothing comes from nothing, does it? There's always a collection of dross around in your head that you kind of draw on to put ideas together. And the sources of ideas of responsive environments, I think, were really quite varied. One clearly, as I've, uh, as, as I've hinted already, was Dutch structuralism. Nobody thinks much about Dutch structuralism today, but it was really very important in the 70s linked up with the, the situationist movement, which has become very trendy again recently, Alde van Eyck, Herman Herzberger, the Cobra Group, really uh, thinking about cities as settings for everyday life. That's, that's fundamentally what they were about, and being very interested in whether the structure of space and the structure of everyday life, how they linked together or didn't. Um, and, and how to make them link together better. So that was a big source of, uh, of influence on many of us. Second obvious source was um, what you might call Anglo-Saxon empiricism, you know, the idea that um, empirical evidence is really important in, in, in understanding the world. 
And that ties us back to good old Kevin Lynch, uh, the image of the city, managing the sense of a region, all those um, Lynchian American kind of uh, ideas that were very much around uh, in the 60s, 70s. And also Bill Hillier, or an, uh, an aspect of Bill Hillier, um, and the beginnings of space syntax thinking, which Sue brought into our group um, very, um, very importantly. And then thirdly, and, and these are three, com they come from completely different, I would say, kind of, you know, philosophical starting points, was um, what I called here Latin rationalism, largely Italian. Um, the morphologists, um, uh, like Canigia, for example, who came and lectured at the Joint Centre. Um, and, and they really, well, they came a little bit, I suppose, from Hillier's typological thinking, but... Um, much more importantly from our students. We had a lot of, uh, in the mid-70s, linked up with the oil crisis and one thing and another, a lot of Latin American countries had scholarships to send <coughs> their students to Britain to learn about urban design in the then new joint centre. And they brought with them um, ideas from Muratori, Canigia, figures like that, that are, again, not as well known now as they used to be. Um, and that was a completely different um, philosophical tradition, intellectual tradition. And the guys and women who had those ideas were also very, very political, often very political uh, from the sort of libertarian left, and they contributed a lot uh, to, to joint centre thinking. Most people will tell you that um, empirical ideas and rationalist ideas just can't be joined together. But we kind of nailed them together in a very messy, ramshackle way. And I, I think of responsive environments almost like a kind of um, one of those uh, sheds that is put up by nailing different shaped bits of wood together in a fairly random way. And if you have enough bits of wood and you nail them together randomly enough, they become enormously strong. You discover you've invented the geodesic dome by accident and you can stamp on it, which many people tried to do, and it just goes doing and kind of, uh, and kind of bounces back. So, at one level, the people have said about responsive environments, oh, it's such a sort of shambolic ragbag of different ideas that don't relate. But it hasn't half lasted, uh, which I suppose is the point. And you can see, um, at the kind of hint of the ramshackle way it was put together, this is one of the um, early mock-ups of, of, of one of the pages. We, we put it in because in these days of digitization of everything, um, it's amazing to think how every word, every, every letter was hand-coded onto coding sheets. Things were hand-drawn, largely by Graham, pasted together literally with a print, um, and, and we produced the, the then wonderful technological miracle, I may say, of the camera-ready book. Because before then, things were hand-engraved on wood blocks, and, and, and it was all very, all very hairy. So... Um, I thought maybe I should run ever so quickly uh, through the sort of key ideas of the book, just in case somebody might have forgotten. But the, the key to it was that the built environment inescapably affects everyday life, uh, that what interested us back in, um, I suppose, say, 1979 or so when we started writing this was the idea that the way the physical structure of the world impacted on people's lives should be so as to open up opportunities and choices in people's lives rather than closing them down. That was our kind of idea that we got from Hertzberg overall. Um, and we came up uh, through a messy process of discussion with a number of urban qualities. We thought of them then, I, I, I wouldn't now, but we thought of them then as qualities that cities had that would open up choices and opportunities in people's lives. One of them was permeability. Paul Moraine, I think, came up with the immortal sort of rule one of urban design. If you can't get there, it can't do anything for you. Um, and uh, so we were interested in how you can design places where you can explore around in an open uh, kind of way rather than constantly kind of running into dead ends, the kind of anti-cul-de-sac movement, if you like. And uh, one of the things um, that we resolved very early on in putting this story together was that um, we weren't interested in writing a book that told people the things to think about. We were actually interested in producing something that was more like a kind of car maintenance manual um, or a pre-flight check manual for an aeroplane or something, a sort of how-to-do-it book. 
And so, and I think that's another one of the reasons why the thing has lasted, actually, because most people are too, um, well, they don't have the balls, if you'll excuse the phrase, to sort of say, you should do it like this. So the, the book is full of um, qualities, but also how do, you, how do you get them? As in this case, like, you know, if you want to get lots of permeability, find out all the connections onto the site and join up the arrows made us realize that urban design is actually fundamentally very, very easy. You can teach urban design to a five-year-old, unlike architecture, which has important ramifications, which you may or may not come back to later on. Um, second thing is, if you uh, uh, could just explore around the place and that's all you can do, it becomes dead boring after a while. Um, and so we came up with the idea that what we needed was variety, variety of experience. That's what will give you choice and how variety of experience of all kinds really in the end depends on a variety of land uses. So we became very interested in how to get a variety of land uses since we noticed with our amazing perception that the world is getting less and less various in terms of land uses and mixed use <coughs> places were turning into industrial estates, housing estates, central business districts and, and so on. And then uh, because we had the dimmest of inklings uh, back in the late 70s that time must come into this somewhere, we were very interested in a quality that we called robustness. We would call it resilience now because robustness turns out to be a word that actually communicates something a bit different than what we had in mind to many people. But the idea of places that can adapt to uh, loads, of, uh, loads of different uses over time. So that as places get old, rents fall, um, you can have a, a bigger variety of uses, all things being equal in a place. And then finally, uh, as we thought about it at the time, well actually there were other qualities, but they're ones that haven't really stood the test of time so well. Um, from Kevin Lynch, um, really the idea of legibility. Um, and uh, Lynch's amazing book, uh, The Image of the City, uh, which certainly was one of the things that and Jane Jacobs that, that sort of turned me on to urban design. Um, very uh, Im important in the development of all this. And of course legibility fits into this picture because if you can't find your way around a place, you can't use it as effectively to get opportunities out of it as you could if you could find your way around it. So all of those um, qualities, uh, permeability, variety, robustness, legibility, and visual appropriateness, which is a bit of a mess, really, and, and richness, which we're still kind of interested in from, from a different point of view. That was, the, that was the sort of vocabulary of qualities that we imagined a built form would have built into it, or not, um, that would offer more, more choices in more people's lives. Um, and we realized, um, and, and this, this little sequence I'm going to show you actually comes from much later, but we realized um, in the original book that um, these qualities are very much associated with particular types of urban form. Permeability is very associated with the highly joined up uh, network of, of, of public linkage. Um, vitality... The, the idea, which is a slightly later kind of quality, um, is it, very much associated with how much life and activity does a building contribute to the public realm through its active interface or not. And when you put those two together, um, you generate uh, what we then thought of as a type of urban form, um, the, the, the perimeter block. And if you uh, fill those perimeter blocks in with a variety of uses, um, then you get a sort of mixed use area. And then to make it legibility, or to make it legible, um, it, it's useful to think about Kevin Lynch's um, categorization of districts, paths, nodes, edges, and landmarks. So there was, right from the beginning actually, a very, um, although we didn't think of it this way at the time, um, the response to environments approach is a very typological approach. It's basically saying, join the streets up, have active building fronts facing onto them. If you do that, you'll generate perimeter blocks, try and figure out how you can get more uses rather than less into the perimeter blocks and figure out how you can make the whole thing legible. And um, that was a, a, a message 
that uh, I think was very powerful, but was resisted um, by large numbers of professionals, particularly from architecture, because instead of seeing it, as I would argue, as a sort of fundamental vocabulary um, to be creative with, um, many people saw it, because they were not used, particularly from the Anglo-Saxon um, tradition, were, were not used to thinking in typological terms. They saw these types of urban form not as a sort of vocabulary to use, but as a set of constraints, a sort of diabolical um, constraint on, on their personal creativity. And it's, it's interesting. This is a little um, a couple of pages from a cartoon book. Um, that one of our students, Cobus Mentz, some of you here may, may know him, now an eminent urban designer of <coughs> the Antipodes, um, is sort of rather jokily um, saying, ah, we've discovered the perimeter block. And obviously, the way the drawing on the right is drawn, um, the perimeter block is a thing. It's kind of terribly fixed and made of stone and so on, rather than uh, how we now would see it as a, as a set of relationships, uh, as, a, as a kind of relational type of... Uh, of operation. So that's what the book was about and a little bit about how it was received um, in Britain. I mean it, it, very double-edged. Uh, it sold an enormous number of books and continues to sell an enormous number of books to this day because it's the only book there is that tells you how to do anything. Yeah? I mean it, it still is. It's amazing. Um, but it sold very widely and is regarded as an important theory book, not just a practical manual, in, not surprisingly, countries um, that have a typological sort of uh, approach to design anyway, uh, like in Latin America, this is Spanish translation, but the big sales are in, are in Latin America. Um, in China, this is, this is the first Chinese translation in uh, Taiwan, in, in, in Cantonese, then in, um, then in um, Mandarin, I fear to think how many of this has been, have been, have been uh, sold. Um, it, it, it kind of went down very much more powerfully, I think, uh, outside Britain. Um, the, I suppose the English language market is, is sort of Britain, New Zealand, Australia, Almost none in the United States, where the Ayn Rand um, tradition of architecture, you know, it's all down to personal creativity, regardless of what you are going to be creative about, um, really kind of rules responsive environments out, I think. Now, obviously, um, partly in response to the kind of critique uh, of, of the kind that I've, that I've mentioned, friendly critique mostly, kind of very productive, um, and partly as a result of the world changing around us, there has been an evolution um, of, of, of our thinking. Of course there has. Um, it, it, both in terms of the qualities that we've realised are important. And I, I mean, every time you try and convert something really complex, a really complex system, um, like an urban settlement, into a set of qualities... It's always, to some extent, an open list, isn't it? Because it depends on the perspective you're looking at it from. So you can add other qualities in, and you can take ones out. I mean, it's wise not to do that too randomly, otherwise the whole thing becomes a complete shambles. But we, we certainly realise, and I, re I remember, um, which may, may be interesting to talk just a little bit about how this evolution um, happened. We ran a course, uh, masterminded or mistress-minded by Sue, at um, oh, some London borough, I can't remember. Oh, Hackney, London Borough of Hackney, uh, for sort of mid-career professionals in the London Borough of Hackney. And there was nothing, there's absolutely nothing in good old responsive environments about safety, security, anything like that. Um, and that was what they really wanted to talk about. So we realised that uh, there needed to be some quality of urban life that was to do with feeling safe. It seemed to us then that calling it safety or security would, would make it look grim and, and everyone would look like a victim. Um, and so we put it the other way around, vitality, how much, how much uh, life and activity do uh, buildings contribute to the, to, the, to the public realm. And I suppose that was about the point uh, at which um, the good old urban design compendium kind of started to be thought about, produced largely by ex-students of ours, really. 
Um, and I think a, a, a much, a much more of an influence because it's much gentler than responsive environments um, on what actually happened um, in, in, in the UK. Um, so uh, the, the, the final set, if you like, of uh, key urban design qualities uh, was, was something like that, the one that settled down after a bit of kind of argy-bargy and, 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 and got sort of built into, uh, into the compendium. The point about all of these, just to go back to the beginning, is that they are to do, supposedly, hopefully, with opening up opportunities in people's lives, opening up choices. And that was very much something that was in the, well, still is in the air, isn't it? But during the 90s, the early years of the reception of responsive environments, loads of um, sociologists were into writing about choice. Um, and phrases like um, choice is the supreme quality, Zygmunt Bauman's Intimations of Postmodernity book, if any of you have read it, began to be, uh, those kind of ideas began to surface. And it, it, it became obvious that if choice is the supreme quality, then you want a choice of ways of choosing things. And you want a choice of ways of choosing how to choose things. And you want a choice of ways of choosing how to choose, how to choose, how to choose, how to choose. How to choose. It's what philosophers call an infinite regress. It's very worrying because it means there's nothing left that is a kind of something solid that you can keep your feet on the ground. You can go one of two ways, I suppose. You can either um, switch on some sort of dreadful fundamentalism, usually some religious kind, whether it be sort of Christianity in parts of the states or Islam or whatever. Uh, but uh, if you're not inclined to do that, uh, you need to look for some other source of roots and uh, that can give you a sense of safety and sort of psychic safety and security. And I think that was the big search in the 1990s, it seemed to us, often leading to um, a comforting sort of regression to the vernacular of whatever place you were in, which did seem to us and to um, other sociologists like Frank Ferreira, for example, that what that did um, was it, uh, it, 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 it told us that the past is better than the present, we should be frightened of the future, it helped to develop a culture of low expectations, as Ferreira called it, and was probably quite a, a scary thing to do in the long run. And so we became very interested in uh, what Laura Nicolau, I remember, called DNA design. Um, how could one learn from an existing place what were its sort of generic DNA characteristics from which one could grow, so to speak, a new place that had those characteristics but was, had a family resemblance to kind of uh, what had been there before rather than copying. I think that was a big interest of ours kind of during the uh, 1990s and on into the early years of the, of the third millennium. This is a book, um, again, much more sold in, in, um, in China than in, in Britain that um, Giorgio Boutina and I wrote a, about place identity, which is, which is about um, this, kind of, uh, this kind of issue. It is available in English if anyone wants to read it. Um, next thing that happened, and I, I, I think it, it was in the air, but only just, I uh, think of the, the Club of Rome report came out in 1976, I think, didn't it? Uh, fears about climate change, um, which really took off um, in the 90s, I think, with the, the um, Rio summit, and uh, etc. Um, and realisation that um, because human settlements are, are associated with so high a proportion, uh, and travelling between human settlements, uh, such a high proportion of uh, CO2 emissions that um, that's something that urban design had to engage with. So I guess uh, by the early years of, of the third millennium, I think this is a little diagram that Sue McGlynn and I put together around two th 2002. Um, the, uh, uh, responsive environments had become, if we can still call it responsive environments, had, had sort of morphed together three areas of interest. One was the original um, opening up choices, which is, I think, the bottom line, what most people actually want uh, out, out, of, out of the city. Secondly, sort of connecting past and future in some hopefully non-nostalgic way, uh, which, again, uh, many people rather desperately want. 
Um, and the third thing was to try to reintegrate sort of humans and natural systems in a way that would be a bit more thoughtful about the impact that humans were having on the rest of the natural world. Um, and I think the two on the left there, if you put them together, they are um, they're really saying if, if, if humans don't like um, the way the, the cities are proposed to be, uh, they won't buy into them. So it's no, there's no point in just focusing on the green bit, um, or, or what is sometimes called sustainability, which is a word I personally hate, um, because okay. if you only focus on sustainability and tell everyone that they've got to wear sandals and have a beard, or if, if you're the kind of person that has a beard, uh, and eat rice, then no one will buy into it. I used to call this sexy sustainability until Sue told me that that was making it sound cheap. Um, in, uh, in Brazil, you can call it that, but, but not in Britain. But you see what I'm trying to say, yeah? And that led to a, a, a fairly major... Um, I know Robert doesn't like words like paradigm, but I'll use it. Paradigm shift uh, away from the original response of environments, which had been all to do with people and the built environment. How can we open up choices for people? Um, and thinking still in, in a, 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 what Ian Lyon, who some of you here will know very well, um, used to call the Judeo-Christian tradition, of, of thinking of humans and, and, and nature as somehow very separate. And that's certainly the way I used to think about the relationship between humans and nature. And, and, and trying to adopt a much more integrated way of thinking, and as important as thinking of feeling about the relationship between humans and what I would now see uh, uh, as the rest of the natural world. Um, very much um, linked up, I suppose, with an interest, certainly in my case, with, with uh, Eastern philosophies, with, with Buddhism and, and, and so on. So we were trying to kind of encourage that shift in our own minds and thinking about if we thought in that way and if we felt in that way, what would we have to think a settlement was? Um, and instead of thinking of it as a thing, I mean, I think I had thought of settlements as things uh, really ever, ever since I came out of the architecture tradition, which is very thing orientated in my opinion. I thought of a city as a big thing. Um, and I began to realise, and I, I, I think um, certainly, uh, certainly Sue and I did, and I'm sure Graham does as well, that instead of that, what a city was was uh, a complex system, which is made of other complex systems. In other words, it's just like any other kind of ecosystem. And you have the land, without which you can't have any kind of settlement, and the land has a water system and a green system. And they change at different rates. They change rather slowly. Then you have a, a public space system. Otherwise, you can't have a settlement. You can't get from one place to another. That changes pretty slowly as well. I mean, the, the street layout of the center of Oxford, 1,000 years old, roughly. Buildings are all different, but the, the street structure is roughly the same. Building plots last about 100 years, some hundreds of years, maybe. Buildings, very ephemeral things, like gone in a flash of, a, of an instant, really. Um, Brooks, Oxford Brooks University, I notice, is now pulling down buildings that are just under 30 years old. Um, seems to be speeding up, hopefully not forever. So all, I began to realise that all the things that I'd been really interested in and thought were the centre of the universe, it's just like that. And there's far more fundamental, long-lasting systems. And the key to all of this is understanding that they change at different rates. And therefore, they are different systems. They must be. But they relate together in very important ways. And it's the relationships between them that matter much more than the things themselves, or at least as much, I would argue, I would argue much more. Um, and that uh, leads into something that doesn't exist yet, so I can't tell you about Well, I can tell you about it in very broad terms. Um, the, the new book, uh, Eco-Responsive Environments, that uh, Sue and I and others are kind of involved with at the moment. So that's a very rough, brief sketch of how we got to where we are now. Some points about successes and failures. Uh, 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 failures, successes there have been lots. I mean, you know, let's not devalue responsive environments. It's, it's, been, a, it's been a good help, I think, to a lot of people. Um, but it's, it has failed in some regards. It, it's made very little impact on architectural culture. Um, 
which is a big shame. Uh, I, 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 think, uh, I think myself that that's because of the way the educational system works. Um, I, I had a very interesting experience a couple of weeks ago. I was in Vietnam running a, 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 a settlement design course in, in uh, Ho Chi Minh City, Saigon. And there was the usual debate that there is in those kinds of things about, is urban design um, a profession? Um, and should there be a, a Ho Chi Minh Institute of Urban Design or, or whatever? Or is it actually a fundamental, as I would argue, a fundamental ground rule of designing almost anything um, in, in, in the real world? And this charming young woman stood up and said, um, no, I agree. I think it should be a, 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 a fundamental discipline because it sounds to me very much like medicine. My father's a doctor, she said. And um, if you're a doctor, uh, you learn all about the body, generally, and then you become a specialist in feet or the bladder or brain or whatever it may be. You don't start off the other way around. If you started off the other way around, you would kill everyone. Uh, and I, that struck me as like amazing. Such, isn't it funny how totally common sense things never occur to you until someone from a different culture says, yeah? So I leave you with that thought, urban design groups. Don't, if any of you harbour the thought that urban design should be a profession with exams and a Royal Institute of, please forget it. Try and, try and break yourselves of this habit. Try and convert every single architecture and planning school in the country, in the world, into being an urban design course, and then we may get better urban design, I would, I would suggest.